This presentation involves the utility of the Focus Assessed Transthoracic Echo Exam, or the FATE exam, and basic perioperative TE in the management of patients. A uh, FATE exam reveals real-time hemodynamics and physiologic determinants and holds immediate diagnostic capabilities. Furthermore, uh, Inexperienced and experienced operators can perform the FATE exam with patients in different positions. It's a very flexible arrangement. For the basic transthoracic echo, basic echo involves the limited application of a basic echo exam to non-diagnostic monitoring within the customary practice of anesthesia. Because the goal of training in basic echo is focused on intraoperative monitoring rather than specific diagnosis, except in emergent situations, diagnoses requiring intraoperative cardiac and surgical intervention or post-op medical or surgical management probably should be confirmed by an individual with advanced skills in echo. Objectives for this presentation. We're going to describe the utility of the FATE exam as a pre-op assessment tool and a rescue ultrasound assessment. We're going to discuss basic perioperative transesophageal echo, or basic TEE, as an advanced cardiac monitor. The American Society of Echocardiography, the American Society of Anesthesiologists, and the Council on Accreditation and the ANA have recognized uh, basic echo as an excellent advanced cardiac monitor. Uh, we're going to also identify 11 ultrasound windows used during um, basic transesophageal echo, and we're going to just, we're going to list five indications for the use of basic echo uh, in anesthesia and cardiopulmonary instability. The FATE exam is an outstanding screening tool as well as a rescue echo assessment. Uh, using the FATE exam, you can evaluate basic hemodynamic determinants, preload afterload and contractility. Instead of reading a CVP number or a wedge number, um, you're actually uh, measuring or assessing the volume itself or the preload itself. You're also um, assessing contractility both globally and regionally instead of using a cardiac output monitor or a, a cardio cue or any other type of, of non-invasive uh, cardiac monitor or cardiac output monitor, including the PPV, stroke volume variability, uh, lid code, the visual AO system, etc. It's sort of like instead of, of uh, trying to calculate what your uh, tidal volume is based on your peak inspiratory pressure on your ventilator, you're actually measuring a spirometer. Um, other things you can tell from the FATE exam include compliance and relaxation status of the heart. <clears throat> as well as different uh, chamber dimensions, dilation, hypertrophy. You can detect uh, myocardial ischemia and heart valve dysfunction, assess for effusion and pulmonary embolus. As well, you can assess for pleural effusion and pneumothorax using uh, the different positions uh, associated with the FATE exam. And finally, pulmonary edema by looking for B lines. In this uh, uh, tool over here to your right, you see you've got the normal view and you've got an effusion, you've got a normal apical four chamber and you've got a uh, hypertrophied LV, a uh, very large LV. You've got a normal basic view of a parasternal long axis as well. You've got a dilated RV here. Um, you can also tell from a short axis view uh, plural effusion and uh, you can also tell from this uh, plural View here, you've got a nice effusion over here on this side. So, in discussing the use of your FATE findings, uh, and again, this is what I say to everybody when they've got a new technology is it a tool or a toy? What are you really using it for? So, some of the things that you can use the your FATE assessment for is you can look at the pump function, LV and RV function. This uh, changes your induction strategies. Maybe you're using the tominate, maybe you're using ketamine, maybe you're using just enough propofol to turn the tubing white, maybe you're changing the, your, your tolerance for how long it's going to take the drug to work. You also may uh, use a little bit more fentanyl instead of overpressurizing with your volatile. You might want to avoid certain uh, drug regimens, uh, beta blockade. You might also want to avoid spinal or epidural, or you might want to choose spinal or epidural based on your skill set versus putting a block in, uh, et cetera, to keep your volatile agent down. It also looks at your tank or your ventricular filling, uh, volume versus restriction of volume, hemodynamic manipulation based on valve dysfunction. Uh, again, these are things that are associated with the FATE uh, exam, but also with the uh, rapid ultrasound uh, for shock and hemodynamic assessment in the RUSH exam. 
pulmonary assessment, you're looking at ventilation modes, maybe you're going to use uh, pressure control ventilation, they've got a pleural effusion, maybe you're using IRFO2, um, maybe airway, you want to use an endotracheal tube because they've got some effusion. Uh, again, a lot of these things go into the decision making besides just what your fate exam is going to show, but this is just another uh, quiver in your, your uh another arrow in your quiver. Uh, also, you're looking at bronchodilators versus diuresis versus chest tube. So again, it's uh, those of you that are, are uh, previously have a history of using your stethoscope for uh, to, uh, to modify your assessment or to make some of your uh, anesthetic plans. Um, maybe you look at chest x-rays. Maybe you look at your, your BNP, um, whatever. Uh, this is just another thing you can use uh, as a tool. So what are some examples of some of your findings that are going to change the way you manage your anesthetic? Well, um, in this case, the 3D image is over here on the left. You can kind of see uh, you've got RV, LV, uh, left atrium, mitral valve, aortic valve, aorta. Um, in, your T, in your 2D echo version or your fate view, you've got your LV, which has pretty thick walls. Uh, the LV wall dimensions are different. Uh, there's a qualitative valve thickness here. Just looking at it, you say, man, that's pretty thick. It doesn't open very well. Maybe I need to use some type of, of Doppler, a color flow Doppler, to see if I've got some MR with this. Uh, maybe you look across the aortic valve to see if there's some, some uh, high velocity based on the the Doppler uh, flow characteristics. These are some of the things that you look at as far as assessment. I mean, that may want, make you want to cancel the case and refer to another, um, to a cardiologist. Um, as well, if you're interop, it may mean that you want to get your blood pressure up to support this big, thick ventricle, which now uh, really lacks this blood pressure. Uh, it may be something where you're really aggressively treating dysrhythmia, so you're trying to stay out of atrial fibrillation. One of the um, other uses of the fate exam, everybody thinks of it being something you look at the heart with, but also assessing for cardiopulmonary instability, whether it's uh, uh, a pre-op low oxygen saturation on room air, or whether it's a post-op uh, low oxygen saturation, along with looking for, um, in your pleural zones, for looking for an effusion, for B lines, things like that. Also, you can take a look and you can look for other causes of shunt, such as this atrial septal defect, as you can see here. You've got this nice little flow pattern, um, and it's crossing the atrial septum, which is obviously not a good thing. And typically what you'll see is you're gonna see a, a left to right flow um, in general because the left atrial pressures are typically higher than right atrial pressures unless you have coughing, straining, um, things like that, Valsalva. One of the more bizarre or eccentric presentations is hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy or HOCOM. And what you see with HOCOM is um, you have a very large uh, septal wall, anteroseptal wall. You also have very thickened walls. You have an ejection fraction of almost 100%. You've also got a great big septum here, and if you measure the septum, it's going to be pretty much over two centimeters. And you're also going to have, you possibly have some left atrial size changes with this if you stick some Doppler on this atri left atrial. Um, left atrium and the mitral valve, you're going to see some, some regurge, probably a little bit of, of anteriorly directed jet. Um, and you also kind of see the LVOT here is kind of narrow uh, as well. Um, some of the anesthesia considerations for this, if you pick it up in pre-op, uh, especially since it's, it's a genetic thing, if somebody has a, a history of, of, of premature death or, or young death of arrhythmia, uh, this is something that's passed on from generation to generation. Anesthesia considerations are uh, they, they like their beta blockers. They don't like to be uh, have too much contractility. The harder it squeezes, the more uh, regurg you have. Uh, contrary to what you would expect. Uh, as well, you'd like to have them nice and full, which is kind of contrary to what you usually think about with, with uh, of trying to avoid too much regurgitation. You also like to have a lot of afterload, which is also completely uh, counterintuitive. But uh, in other words, what you want to do is you want to use a pretty good bit of volatile on these folks. You want to have some beta blockade on board. You want to make sure they're well hydrated and you want to keep their blood pressure up so they have a lot more afterload to keep them from having as much SAM or uh, uh, septal anterior motion and MR. 
So along with the parasternal long axis view, which is very useful in patients with, with hokum, uh, the apical four chamber is very useful as well in detecting a uh, few things such as the, the septum and its hypertrophy, but also the MR jet that you can kind of see here is a coandal jet uh, because this anterior leaflet over here is kind of being pulled down by the, the, the vigorous LV contraction. So once again, you want to maintain a nice deep anesthetic in these patients. Preoperative screening uh, with the FATE exam for patients with known mitral insufficiency um, can be pretty comp complex because often it depends very much on their state of filling, their NYHA class, whether it's NYHA 1 today, but usually it's a 2 or a 3. Uh, but also uh, judging the degree of MR is kind of difficult because you can't really say anymore how much of the left atrium is taken up is going to be a good index as far as 1 plus, 2 plus, 3 plus, 4 plus. The, the goals of the FATE exam are not to make us into to neo cardiologist, but to kind of give us um, a little bit of a qualitative assessment of, of the heart and its amount of regurg. For example, this may not necessarily be a patient if you've got some MR like this, and you can usually tell by the uh, width of the regurgitant jet more than anything else. Um, like we talked about in the previous presentation, but you're going to try to avoid extremes of hypertension. You're going to avoid extremes of, of low heart rate. You may want to reconsider putting a spinal in because once you put a spinal in, you think, well, that's going to decrease the afterload, which is good for MR, but it's also going to decrease the preload. And compensatory mechanisms in patients with MR in all heart failure is typically the RAS system, which is the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, which means they're going to try to retain fluid because the kidneys are angry because the forward flow is slow. So then you put a spinal in and all of a sudden your, your preload's down and you're hypotensive and you're having to give fluid. And then when the spinal wears off then all of a sudden you're in uh, you've gone from NYHA class 1 to NYHA class 4. Also this is a very nice um, uh, rescue assessment as well and if that's the case often you want to restrict the fluid or maybe even diurese them maybe get their afterload down maybe even give them some contractility drug to improve the RV function because the RV does not like MR. Mitral stenosis is a tough little assessment. Um, a lot of times uh, you end up uh, having some of the same things that you see with an air embolus, which is RV dysfunction. And typically with RV, with, with MS, you have some RV dysfunction associated with it. Uh, there's not a lot of MS anymore in our society because we pretty much have gotten rid of, of rheumatic fever and the, the ravages upon the mitral valve that, that, uh, that rheumatic fever has. But you do have a lot of patients with mitral valve repair. You have a lot of patients with mitral valve replacement. And when you replace a mitral valve, especially if it's a tissue valve over the course of the next seven or eight years, you get some degradation. And typically, it presents with mitral stenosis. And with mitral stenosis, what you see is you see a very thickened mitral valve, which, as you can see here uh, in this apical four chamber, but also you see a very turbulent jet, high velocity jet flow through this mitral valve during uh, diastole. Again, one of uh, my best assessments is sticking a probe on and getting a quick uh, down and dirty look at what your EF is and whether or not you've got any wall motion abnormalities. And what I'm typically looking at with a, a transthoracic echo is I'm looking at the anterior wall here because there's the near field. That's where the transducers on the chest wall uh, going through the chest. Here's the anterior wall, inferior wall, lateral wall, septal wall. And you know you're in the middle of the heart because there's the posterior and anterior uh, lateral papillary muscles, RVs over here. So you're looking at all these different findings, and this is the uh, probably the best index of all of, of what's going on. And if you do rescue echo as well in the middle of the case, typically about 30% of the time you've got LV and or RV dysfunction as the problem uh, causing the hypotension. We talked in the previous slide about how you can have uh, LV dysfunction and how it's a major contributor to cardiopulmonary instability uh, during anesthesia. You can also have RV dysfunction, which is not something that you think about very much because the LV is, is classically what you think about when you think about blood pressure. But if the RV is down, the LV is typically underfilled or the RV acts as a bad neighbor and the LV is not able to corkscrew and squeezes in, in its usual um, symmetrical uh, manner. 
this is if the RV is down, you treat RV dysfunction completely differently than, than LV dysfunction in a way. But this is now a systemic ventricle, so you're going to give a, a much higher blood pressure because it no longer fills during all phases of the cycle, but it also is just filling during diastole just like the LV does. Also, the RV is has got a starling pyramid instead of a starling curve. So you're typically wanting to get the, uh, you're wanting to avoid hypoxia. You want to avoid hypercarbia. Uh, you're wanting to avoid high tidal volumes. You may want to avoid certain PEEP. You also want to recruit the alveoli as much as you can, probably using pressure control ventilation, because if the alveoli are collapsed and have atelectasis, then the capillaries in the alveolus are collapsed, and then you end up having a tremendous amount of pulmonary vascular resistance. And finally, perhaps your, your best go-to SVR drug uh, may be something that doesn't really negatively impact the RV. So in other words, maybe you need to be using vasopressin, which doesn't really uh, vasoconstrict the pulmonary vasculature as much as the, as the systemic vasculature. So over the last decade, perioperative echo has expanded to hemodynamically managed patients undergoing non-cardiac surgery in addition to cardiac surgery, such that uh, TTE is useful in non-cardiac operating rooms to monitor patients with a history of cardiopulmonary disease or in whom hemodynamic or cardiopulmonary instability is suspected. It's a very unique imaging modality that allows providers to visualize the dynamic function of the heart, which in turn promotes ongoing adjustments of surgical and medical interventions. And some of the general indications include refractory hypotension, hypoxia, EKG changes, arrhythmias, and even cardiac arrest. And as we talked about the subcostal four-chamber view, this is a view that you can get in the middle of CPR. So uh, you usually think of transesophageal echo for rescue echo. But to be honest, um, as much as I like TEE because it's really much easier to get the windows and the windows are, are better, you can get the same TTE view for every TE view that you've got. And we'll talk about TEE a little bit later on. But the TTE views, uh, apical 4 is the same as the metasophageal 4. The parasternal long axis is the same as the metasophageal long axis. And the transgastric short axis is the same as the parasternal short axis. So these are the three basic TE rescue views. And you can get this very same thing with TTE, which you're, you're uh, going through with the last presentation and with this presentation. So rescue echo uh, is, again, uh, echo that is not necessarily planned. It's just something that you do in the face of cardiopulmonary instability where the presentation is not something that you can just put your finger on or get your head around. Uh, we've all dealt with hypotension probably every single day in the OR, and we kind of know what it's from. It's typically from the, the vasodilation from our volatile anesthetic versus the MPO status versus some type of surgical manipulation versus bleeding. But sometimes you just can't figure out why you're hypotensive after you've uh, considered yourself to have adequately volume resuscitated, uh, you're treating with neosinephrine or whatever presser you're using, and you're not happy with with what you what you uh, uh, with with the the progress that you're making. So Shilcut did some very nice work. Uh, Sasha Shilcut did some work on on 31 patients who uh, were undergoing non-cardiac surgery that experienced perioperative hemodynamic instability uh, that was not resolved with the typical standard. Um, um, treatments such as uh, volatile agents, uh, reduction, uh, volume, pre uh, pressors, this and that. And what she found was that uh, about 45% had LV dysfunction and 16% had hypovolemia. And this is, you know, the, the, the ratios are pretty consistent here in just about all the rescue echo studies. Jasa Davies and everyone else found that hypovolemia, LV dysfunction, RV dysfunction is pretty much the, the, the big issues. Uh, of course, you, in Sasha's work, uh, I guess she must have had a, a, a bit of a you know, trauma practice. This is type, typically what you see with trauma, uh, especially if they've been sitting around the unit and trauma unit. Uh, about 50%, 52% have uh, uh, thrombus that have had a long bone fracture. But typically, the you know if you're if you're talking about tool or toy, what they found was that the impact was indeed significant, and that drug treatment changes resulted in 21 patients, fluid or event change in, in 10. So again, LV failure is something that is 
30 to 45 percent of the time uh, is, is is the issue. And what you're looking at is you're looking at whether or not the LV wall thickens. Does the chamber shrink during systole? What's the approximate uh, ejection fraction? And, and most of us use eyeball EF. You can use Simpson's biplane. You can use all sorts of different measurements, fractional area, shortening, and all that. But pretty much you're looking at this transthoracic echo and you're saying, wow, man, I need to start an epi drip. I need to use a veteran instead of Neo. I may need to, to restrict the volume. Uh, and it's not like I'm saying the EF is 17.2%. I'm saying the EF is bad. It's either good or bad. And good means you treat it one way, and bad means you treat it another way. Again, it's TTE can be complicated as you want to make it, or it can be as simple as you want to make it, and it can be a tool that, that is something that works perfect in, in your practice. And we looked um, at uh, RV failure in a previous slide. This is an apical four chamber. And what you're seeing is you're seeing the RV is not half the size of the LV. It's, it's more like the same size or a little larger. And on top of that, um, the RV typically when it starts to fail or it encounters high afterload will have tricuspid insufficiency. And you can just put some Doppler tricuspid valve here and you can see that you end up having some a, a good bit of TR. And again, you're not saying, okay, um, the RVEF is 29%. You're saying good or bad. And if this RV is bad, you're treating it uh, in a completely different fashion than if the LV is bad. You're not given a bunch of, 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 uh, of drugs that are going to increase the pulmonary vascular resistance. You're hopefully using a little bit of vasopressin. Uh, you're doing some different ventilation strategies, etc. So I work with a, a very mean-spirited thoracic surgeon uh, that says common things are common, and he's exactly right. Common things are common. Hypovolemia is much more common than people like to think. They think, well, I've given three liters of fluid. I, I'm thinking that I've got some circulatory overload here, and I've sent them into failure, and then you stick the probe on, and sure enough, you've got almost complete collapse of the ventricle during systole, which tells you that you've got uh, some type of of uh, hypovolemia. You can also look in the IVC view, uh, which is a very nice index based on collapse of the, of the IVC right around the hepatic vein to give you an index of, of your filling as well. And you can look at parasternal short axis as we saw uh, earlier, and you can see your volume status as well. Um, all the papillaries touching, all these different things. And if you do do some, some echo, you do some fate exams, you pretty much get up to speed pretty quickly with what, um, what hypovolemia is and what impaired contractility is. We've talked about tamponade a little bit already. Uh, tamponade is not that uncommon depending on your surgical practice. If you work in an electrophysiology lab practice and you're doing laser lead extractions and you're putting catheters in the left atrium and you're, you're putting holes in the heart, this is what you see a lot. So an effusion here, you can kind of base it on uh, how why the effusion is, whether or not you need to do a pericardiocentesis or go to the OR. Uh, but again, this is something that uh, you see it once and you never forget it. It's, it's a very easy diagnosis to make, and it's something that requires some type of surgical intervention. And it also changes your, your management of the patient completely. I see uh, uh, PE in the cardiac operating room uh, not too infrequently. Usually it's a, it's a chronic or CTEF uh, thing because typically if, if, it's, if you've got uh, acute PE, uh, it either gets better pretty quickly or, or bad things happen. And when you're talking about PE, we're talking about uh, the, the big time PE, not the, the different derivations of PE. Uh, but you can see here it's, it's pretty obvious this is a subcostal four, which is quick down and dirty, especially if things are going south on you. And you can see very quickly the RV is just huge and the RA is massive. And you put some color on here, you'd see a lot of TR from the, the RV that doesn't like it. You've got free wall that's not moving, but the apex is preserved. That's McConnell's sign. And then you can also take a look at the IVC view and you can see that the, the IVC is just huge and dilated. So if you've ever seen a TE or a TTE, or you've stuck a probe on yourself, you, and you get a lot of oohs and ahs, you think, man, that is really cool. But is it a toy or is it a tool? Is it something you're really going to use? So you ask yourself, out of all the things we've looked at so far in this presentation, did it cause any impact changes 
or any management changes uh, or any interventions? Well, yeah, about 60% of the time in this study from from uh, from Nicholas Markin from Utah, uh, they looked at 364 patients that they were called on to do emergency or rescue echo on. And what they found is that 60% of the time it resulted in a management change. 62% uh, of the time it was intra-op and 54% post-op. So the types of management changes by far the, the most common were fluid administration. Uh, it's not very cool or exotic, but that's, that's just the way it is. Inotropes, about 18% of the time, they had some LV dysfunction as far as management changes go. Uh, as far as, as presser use, as far as, okay, well, you know what? You got good volume status, you got good contractility, you just need a presser. Um, these are the different changes that resulted in. By far, these were the three most common. So it's a very useful um, tool, transthoracic echo, Rescue Echo, Fade Exam. So advantages of Focus Assess Trans Thoracic Echo include the ability to do it on awake patients, to use it as an assessment tool. It's very easy to pull one out and do a quick rescue echo, even with a handheld. You don't have to run and find uh, a trans thoracic echo. Uh, however, in the operating room, uh, Basic TE is probably the most robust monitor of cardiac and hemodynamic function you can find. Uh, a couple of reasons for that. You have direct assessment instead of indirect assessment. So if you're really a big vigileo person or stroke volume variation, or you've been keeping track with the patient and you know the patient well, that's great, but that's an indirect assessment uh, versus a direct assessment. And again, I like to correlate this with peak inspiratory pressure versus a spirometer for gauging your tidal volume. It can be placed anytime intraoperatively as long as the head's accessible. So back in the day, before they realized the pulmonary artery catheter didn't really change outcomes except maybe the length of stay and cost, um, they were putting a pulmonary artery catheter in, folks. But now you don't even have to do that. You can just do the uh, what I call the student fish hook because that's how students like to put LMAs in. And you just shove the TE probe in. And uh, it's, it's easier than putting in a, a bougie for a Nissen. Um, the only issue is that you have an observer-dependent interpretation so that you really need to do, you need to get your hands on, on an echo and you need to watch and, and check out a few echoes before you really know what you're doing. But again, this is something that can be done intraoperatively. The complication rate is actually very low. It's a mortality of less than one in 10,000 patients. I know one person who's had one perf of the, I don't know, the cumulative number of probably 30,000 of all the people that I've worked with. So TE can be extremely complicated. You can take it up to the level of the cardiologist, to the interventional cardiologist level, or you can keep it as simple as just some basic imaging and hemodynamic monitoring, which is it's probably its highest utility. Um, but the probe is placed in the esophagus for basic echo in, in one of three positions. But to be honest, all but one is mid-esophageal. The transgastric is the only one that is not in the mid-esophagus, which is important when we come to looking at how easy this can be made. Um, reflected, reflected signals are collated to produce an image, and a two-dimensional image is generated of the structure. This is very similar to transthoracic echo as far as the imaging goes, but the difference is instead of the transducer being on the surface of the chest, outside in, it's in the esophagus, so it's going inside out. So in the near field, instead of having the apex of the heart in a four chamber, you have the left atrium. So where is the mid-esophageal position? It's always right next to the left atrium, so your left atrium is always going to be the structure that's the closest to the near field. So some of the information available by basic TEE is left and right ventricular function. You're looking at the LV and RV ratio, but also you're actually watching them beat. You're looking at the heart wall motion, heart chamber volume, vessel integrity. You can look at the ascending and descending uh, aorta, as well as valve function and integrity. And this is much easier than transthoracic echo because you have a much better window. You don't have to hold the probe on the chest. Typically, the probe is going to stay in the same spot in the esophagus, and, and you're able to manipulate the knobs with absolutely no problem. It's, it's a very easy, wonderful monitor once you get the hang of it. Also, you can find heart tumors, myxomas, vegetations, and it's very useful for pericardial effusion. For perioperative TE, uh, evaluation of cardiac and aortic structure and functions. 
cardiopulmonary instability, where uh, also TTE is non-diagnostic, such as this patient with, with atrial flutter. Uh, they haven't been on any type of, of blood thinner, and you're worried about cardioverting them and giving them a stroke. You can stick a TE probe in and evaluate the left atrial appendage. Intraoperatively, uh, it's very cumbersome to get to the chest wall, especially if you're doing uh, any type of, of upper abdominal procedure. And handing the, the surgeon a uh, probe cover and a probe is not exactly ideal. Also, you can guide transcatheter procedures, uh, uh, EP cases, this and that. And also, in general, for critically ill patients, it's a very nice technique. Despite the safety record of TEE, there are some absolute and relative contraindications to TEE. Uh, absolute include, include things like perforated esophageal viscous. You got a really nasty esophageal stricture or tumor, you should be putting the probe in. This is not uh, as useful as an arterial line is. There's no better monitor in the world than a, a radial arterial line or any type of arterial line. So you can really say to yourself, you know, I can do more harm than good. Uh, esophageal perforation or laceration, you got a TE fistula, it's not a good idea, obviously. And of course, if you got an upper GI bleed that's active, it's not a good thing to do either. Relative contraindications, radiation to the neck and mediastinum, yeah, maybe you shouldn't be putting a probe in. Uh, a, a, a history or recent GI bleed, maybe you should stay away. Barrett's esophagus, hiatal hernia, again, these are relative. Neck immobility, I kind of crossed that out. Coagulopathy, uh, and esophageal varices typically uh, isn't going to keep us from sticking one in. Uh, if they have active bleeding with the varices, it's another story. Coagulopathy, we've stuck them in people all the time for EP procedures with an ACT of over 300. So again, this is a relative thing. If it's some type of coagulopathy from uh, surgical coagulopathy, maybe you need to not be sticking the probe in. It's just a, it's a judgment call, but these are relative contraindications. Again, you can do, do a lot more harm with, with a TE if you go wandering in like a Philistine and shoving it in somebody. So take care with it. Some probe and equipment considerations. You should use a bite block um, to protect the teeth from the TE probe, but also to protect the TE probe from the teeth. Uh, a TE probe typically costs about $50,000. Generous lubrication, um, I'm not talking about putting 10 packs of lube in the oropharynx like I had one physician colleague that liked to do that. But in general, uh, if you decrease the amount of air uh, in the esophagus and, and, and have, improve your contact, it works better. Jaw thrust is very useful. Uh, some people like to use a, a, a laryngoscope. Uh, that you, I see that done probably once a year. Um, insert to 30 to 35 centimeters, typically. Uh, if you're thinking about where your endotracheal tube is, it's in the trachea. And if you think about where your left atrium is, it's going to be beyond the carina. Contraindications to sticking the probe in, again, including esophageal and gastric pathology. Obviously, if you've had a gastrectomy, uh, you probably need to rethink putting the TE probe in. But we do that from time to time. Um, we just don't go into the stomach with the probe. Intraoperative complications, esophageal perforation, uh, very rare. Again, I know one guy. Um, GI, pharyngeal hemorrhage, um, that's not very common either. Dental damage, um, believe it or not, is, is not something that I've seen. Um, oral and lip damage, I see it all the time. Very common, and it's usually because of the bite block, pinching the lip. And um, sometimes it gets confused with the DL, sorry. Um, Cardiologist putting it in, uh, by far it's the most common uh, 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 intraoperative complication. It, it approaches 10%. Airway compromise, um, not usually, but in pediatrics, when you've got a non anesthesia person uh, driving the probe, typically if you think the tube's out, the tube is out. Distraction from the patient is, is one of the top complications. And um, I had a, I think I spoke with Joel Kaplan in 2009 about this when I was in San Diego at the ANA meeting. And, and we both agreed that it's, it's very distracting and you should probably uh, keep it to what its best use is, which is uh, a high utility hemodynamic monitor. Misinterpretation is a very uh, strong argument about not using it unless you know what you're doing. Uh, what's the worst thing than no information? And that would be misinformation. So misinterpretation is something that happens. If you start doing some TEE, just look at a lot of stuff online, get your hands on a simulator, and it really aids you. Uh, the more you see, the better you become. 
uh, we're the plumbers of medicine. Uh, the smartest are not the best uh, at, at TE interpretation, but the, the person that has seen the most is probably the best at managing this. Saw this in a previous presentation, and uh, again, just the basic physics of ultrasound. Uh, you're basically emitting brief pulses of sound from a piezoelectric crystal. The sound waves going down and bouncing off the structure of interest. Hopefully, you've got it perpendicular based on how you've got the probe manipulated, and the returning pulses of sound are converted into energy, which generates a shape. Uh, again, the best image is generated when the beam is perpendicular to the structure, and that comes down to what you do with the probe. And that comes with just a little bit of experience, maybe uh, using a simulator. We talked about transthoracic echo and how you have sliding, tilting, rocking, angulation, and rotation. Here, you're, you're, it's more like a fiber optic bronchoscope. You're advancing, you're withdrawing, you're turning left, you're turning right, you're anaflex, you're retroflex. And instead of rotating the probe, you can actually rotate the beam by hitting an omni button. So you can actually rotate this between zero and 180 degrees without even turning the probe. And it's very nice, it's very convenient, and uh, if you've done some transthoracic echo, the first time you do TE, you say, wow, man, we need to do this for everybody. But really, uh, it's kind of hard to do it in a wake patient. Uh, but you can do it with a little bit of propofol. Again, uh, you have upper esophageal, which is up there where you're looking at the the, the aortic arch. You have uh, deep transgastric where you're looking backwards through the heart so you can look at the, the aortic valve with, with a Doppler. You have transgastric where we, which is like the peristernal short axis, which gives us a nice cut right through the heart so you can see what you're feeling in contractility is. But in general, your mid esophageal views is where you mostly are. So you're going between the left atrium, uh, anterior border to the posterior border, or, or cephalad and call border of the left atrium, and you're not really getting much past that. So pretty much the structure you're going to see in the near field is going to be your left atrium. The basic perioperative TEE views were established by the American Society of Echo. And these are very similar to the four views or the four positions in the FATE exam, but instead they have 11 positions. So the mid esophageal four chamber view, you're going to go to zero degrees on your omni, uh, which is zero degrees on the control, so the beam is neutral. And you're going to be able to see all four chambers. You're going to see wall motion. You're going to be able to see filling. You're going to be able to see contractility. You're going to be able to see MR and TR if you put some Doppler on your valves. You're also going to see in the two chamber view, you're going to see the anterior and inferior walls, left atrium, left ventricle, mitral valve, left atrial appendage. That's at 90 degrees on the omni. And most of the time when you're omni and it's 0, uh, 90, uh, or 130. Sometimes you go to 30 for, for a couple of views. The long axis, which is similar to the peristernal long axis, you're going to still be in that four chamber view and you're going to go to 130 degrees on your omni you're going to get a nice view of the aortic valve and the mitral valve and the rv if you and this is the most difficult view to get for people that don't get the use the correct technique but the bicaval where you have the inferior vena inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava left atrium which is always the top of the screen in the right atrium you get a nice view of the atrial septum and if you're looking for wires you can find that there along with the pfo the mid-esophageal right ventricular inflow outflow view, you go to 30 degrees from the four chamber and you get a nice view of the, of the RV, uh, pulmonic valve and tricuspid valve. Aortic valve short axis, you're going to pull back. You still have that left atrium at the top of your screen, but you're looking at the aortic valve and you can look for AI. You can also look for, for opening uh, and obvious calcification. Mid papillary short axis is very similar to the uh, uh, fate exams peristernal short axis. You see the inferior wall at the top now because you're looking inside out the uh, uh, near fields at the top and then the far fields at the bottom where your anterior wall is. But you get a nice view of volume uh, along with function and wall motion. You go to the ascending aorta, you pull back and you're going to get a nice view of the ascending aorta and look for a dissection. Uh, if you go to 90 degrees from that very same view, you get the long axis view, which is just like rotating uh, when you're getting um, the uh, IVC view uh, from the subcostal. And you're going to see the nice long axis view of the aorta, so you look for dissection and atheroma. And finally, you're going to get the descending aorta, which is basically just turning a probe to the left. You get it in short axis and long axis view.
The first view is a mid-esophageal four chamber. Again, you have LV, RV, LA, RA. Uh, notice the RV is about half the size of the LV. Uh, the wall motion is good. This is the antro, infroceptal, and this is the anterolateral wall. You're looking at the intraatrial septum, and you're looking at the interventricular septum. You're looking at the pericardium, and you're looking for an infusion. Very similar to an apical four chamber. Um, but it's just a much easier uh, thing to manage and your views are much better. This is a mid-esophageal four chamber and what pops out at you immediately is you're looking at the RV LV ratio and the RV is actually larger than the LV. So obviously you have some RV dysfunction here. Um, then you start looking at things like coaptation. Uh, you look at the mitral valve coaptation. Maybe you're looking for some color on the mitral valve to see if MR is why your RV is big. But in general, uh, you also look at the, the anterolateral antro, uh, infroceptal walls to see if you've got any type of, uh, of wall motion abnormality. This is the two chamber, and what you're doing basically is you're going to 90 degrees on the Omni. So you're just turning that beam from this way to you see all four chambers to this way. You're just uh, like rotating your, your probe um, uh, with doing a fade exam. So you're looking at the true anterior wall, true inferior wall, and you can see any wall motion abnormalities. You can typically pick up the left atrial appendage over here and look for smoke. Uh, you look at the mitral valve as well. Uh, you can also look for an effusion and wall motion. And this is your two chamber view and you've got some anterior wall ischemia. You can see that this anterior wall is just not thickening very well uh, compared to the inferior wall, which is moving towards the center, just like that. You can also, again, look for your left atrial appendage. You can look for an effusion. Uh, again, this is in the context of hemodynamic instability, ST segment changes, this and that. This is a long axis view, and you've got a nice view of the aorta and the aortic valve, uh, the LV, the anteroceptal wall, infralateral wall, mitral valve, uh, and these are a couple of leaflets, the P2 and A2. Previously, we saw uh, A1 through 3 and, and P1 through 3 as well. So you can kind of guess if you had some prolapse as to which leaflet was bad. And pretty much in basic echo, you're just saying you got some MR or you got some mitral valve prolapse. You're not trying to make some definitive decisions. But again, uh, what I found with TEE is that you start out at the monitoring level and you progress very quickly into uh, some of the other levels, uh, whether you want to or not. <laughs> but you can look at LV volume and function. Uh, this is my favorite view to look for aortic insufficiency as well as any type of, of aortic stenosis uh, or any strange leaflet coaptation. This is that same mid-esophageal long axis view, and it looks a little bit busy, but what you've got is you put a color Doppler on the mitral valve and the aortic valve at the same time, which is very easy to do. Now what you notice is that you've got some blood flow during diastole across the aortic valve, which is not very physiologic. So obviously you've got some aortic insufficiency. And if, if you're going to try to judge the amount of AI this patient's got, you're basically looking at the how much of the LVOT the regurgitant jet's taken up. And it's taken up almost the whole thing. So I'm saying he's got severe aortic insufficiency. But you're also looking at the anteroceptal wall, infralateral wall while you're there, uh, pericardium, and this and that. This is a mid-esophageal bicable view, um, and getting this view, you're pretty much going to get um, the, the mid-esophageal four chamber, get the right atrium in the middle of the screen, and then you're going to hit the Omni button, which is like the remote uh, on your, your TV, on the volume on your TV remote. All men know where this is, and you're going to see where the left atrium is. You can see the right atrium, SVC, IVC, uh, crystal terminalis, the station valve, and this is where you're going to see any wires come in. This is where you put some color up here and look for an ASD or a PFO. Um, and, and you can also look here for your, your wire for your percutaneous ECMO or whatever other fancy stuff you do. But in general, this is uh, the first view of the day for me because I'm looking for the wire from the, uh, from the central line.
And this is a metasophageal bicaval of a patient that's got a, an ASD. And what you've got is you've got some left to right flow across this uh, intraatrial septum, which is not very physiologic, obviously. And you can say from this that you've got uh, an ASD, and it may be time to go get an AMPLAT secluding device in, uh, but it would certainly explain why you might have uh, right ventricular dysfunction um, and in certain situations, shunt and low uh, oxygen saturation. This is the mid-esophageal aorta, aortic valve short axis, and you basically, from your fourth chamber, you're pulling back a few centimeters until you get the Mercedes sign here. And you've got your non-coronary cusp, your left coronary cusp, and your right coronary cusp. Sometimes you can see the right coronary artery coming off here, or the left, you can see the left, a little bit of the left coronary artery right there coming off. Um, uh, typically, you're going to get... Uh, this view to look for some type of aortic valve disorder. Sometimes you have a bicuspid aortic valve. Sometimes you have aortic stenosis. Sometimes you have AI. This is a nice view to get some AI in as well. Um, at the same time, this is often a very good view to look at your atrial septum. Uh, if you, you can see the atrial appendage coming and going here. If you pull back a little further, you probably get a nice view of the left atrial appendage if you're doing some EP lab work. And this is uh, a patient with aortic valve stenosis, and you can see a uh, very hyperechoic, echogenic aortic valve. You can see that it doesn't open very well. You can actually freeze this and measure with an area tool and see what your uh, aortic valve area is, but typically that's done with some type of Doppler because the aortic valve doesn't really sit uh, nice and level, and it's kind of difficult to get a nice uh, uh, aortic valve area, even using a good area tool and a, and a, and a mouse, a, a trackball mouse. But typically you can uh, put some color across that and also look for some degree of, of AI. And if you go from 30 to 60 degrees uh, from the aortic valve, uh, short axis, you're going to get the aortic valve here, but also you get a nice view of the right ventricle, pulmonary valve, tricuspid valve. Uh, you can put some color on here and look for TR. Um, but, but basically, you're looking at the RV, you're looking at all structures in a couple of views. And the first view you got of the RV was in the mid esophageal four chamber view. And then you can look in this view as well, and you can see the nice view of the RV, free wall of the RV. Uh, you can even look for PI if you like to look. Uh, this is my favorite view if I'm having trouble getting the swan to float. I can typically find the swan and pick it up and see whether I need to twist it left or right. Uh, and you, you can see the body of the swan, but you can't really see the tip unless you've got the balloon up. So you need to probably leave the balloon up at all times. And you can see from this view, this is a patient with a really sick RV. Um, you can see the difference. The RV is big, boggy. The free wall doesn't move very well. If you put some color on here, I'm sure you'd see a lot of TR as well. Again, you like to look at all structures in, in at least two views. And that's the beauty of the 11 views. You don't have to have all 11 views to get the job done, but you should be able to get all 11. There are actually 28 views in comprehensive echo. Uh, I can get I, I, I can use 25 routinely, but really, what's the point? I'm getting the job done with 11, and, you know, we are busy in the operating room. We're taking care of the patient. Uh, we may be at a point where we're having to get blood. We're having to start new pressors, and we certainly don't have time to stand around and ooh and ah at the echo. So I recommend that you take a very high-utility approach with this, and that's why 11 views is probably just sufficient for what you're doing here. This is a uh, transgastric mid-papillary short axis. This is the only view that you're not in the mid-esophagus. So you're not going to have the left atrium at the top of the screen. So what's the closest structure uh, to the esophagus when you advance the probe into the stomach? You're going to see uh, the inferior wall of the LV. So this is the esophagus, and then this is the posterior or inferior wall of the LV, anterior wall. And you advance it until you get the papillary muscles, the anterolateral uh, here and a post, uh, anterolateral or posterior papillary and an anterolateral posterior post, uh, papillary muscle here as well. Infraventricular septum here, uh, you look for an infusion here, but you can look, if you put your finger right in the middle there, you can see the EF is probably about 50%, 60%, but you don't have to say it's 53 or 54, you just say good or bad, because that's how, that's 
that's going to affect your decision making as far as your volatile agent, uh, how you treat the hypotension. Also, look at the filling. Uh, papillary muscles are not touching, so you're probably uh, euvolemic and good with volume. You can probably just go ahead and treat it uh, like you do any other time. Now, this is something I see a lot. This is where after I come off bypass or if I think I've got some hypotension going on and I think I'm, I'm concerned about my volume status versus contractility, I'm taking a look in the stomach. And if you put your, your finger right there, your ejection fraction is pretty darn high. But notice how the paps are touching. You've got some volume issues. You need, you've got have hypovolemia here. Anterior walls moving well, inferior walls moving well, lateral walls moving well. So you know you don't have an LAD occlusion, you don't have an RCA or a CERC occlusion as well. Your hypotension is very simple. Common things are common. It also bears us some uh, interest to look at the descent and aorta from time to time. Um, I look at the descent and aorta a lot in my cardiac practice because I'm looking for a wire, uh, I'm looking for a grunge, uh, I'm looking for a dissection, sometimes post-pump. Uh, also, it's a good place to look for an effusion, uh, for a uh, pleural effusion. But typically, I'm uh, going to, from a mid-esophageal position, I'm going to rotate all the way to the left because the aorta is in the it's to the left of the heart, and I'm going to typically pull back a little bit past the pulmonary vein, and I'm going to find the descent in aorta, and, and this is, I zoomed it. I did not increase the depth, but I zoomed it. We talked about that in the previous presentation, the difference between zoom and, and depth change, but you're looking for plaque around it. You're looking for dissection. You're looking for a false lumen, uh, and you might even stick some color on there to make sure that you don't have a false lumen. And this is a patient where, unfortunately, you've got a nice little dissection flap here. And um, you've got, uh, I don't see any plaque in there, but definitely you've got this dissection. And that changes your management considerably as well. You're typically going to keep your blood pressure down. You might want to decrease your ejection velocity by giving some beta blockers, this and that. Now, this is associated with a high degree of uh, misdiagnosis from artifact, so you need to probably put some color on there and make sure there's some color flow in this lumen, because sometimes you get a mirror artifact uh, in people that are, have, have a lot of plaque uh, in, in the chest and have a lot of calcium in the chest. I once had a patient come down. He was too big to fly in the helicopter. He was 600 pounds with a dissection. He drove down. When he finally got there, he was too big for the bed to come through the room, so he had to literally walk over. We, we put him to sleep, put the probe down, and he was was clean as a whistle. So again, uh, the only thing worse than no information is misinformation. This is the long axis view of the descending thoracic aorta, and you can see uh, you just went 90 degrees here, or 95 degrees, 100, whatever, and you can see this is the, the, the long view. Um, instead of cutting straight across in the short axis, this is the long axis view. So you can get a nice view of the walls of the aorta, look for plaque, look for wire, balloon pump, you're looking for the wire from the balloon pump. Uh, typically, I'll follow this all the way up to the left subclavian and make sure it's positioned correctly. This is a decent aorta, long axis, uh, 90 degrees, 95 degrees, and what you've got is you've got this little dissection flap here. And you can, again, put some color on there to make sure you've got some color flow in it. And you may end up having to go down on your scale on your, your Doppler, go from 60 to, to 30 to, to see the flow because it's not very, uh, doesn't have a very high velocity. But that's very key in, in, in ruling this out or in. This is uh, pulling your probe all the way back from your uh, um, uh, mid-esophageal four chamber, and you're looking at the ascending aorta. As you see over here, you're looking at your pulmonary artery, as you see here, and you're looking at your right PA and left PA and pulmonic valve. Uh, SVC is over here as well. And you can notice that you've got a nice clean aorta. You, If you have a pulmonary artery catheter, you can see it in here. It usually goes in the right PA. If you've got a, a PE, you can usually see some uh, fuzziness, smoke, sometimes just some some out and out clot there. But you're looking for uh, the aorta at the aorta for size. This is an, it's a, a, one of the places you measure. Typically, you measure in the long axis view. 
in this view, you, you've got the same thing. You've got a nice dust section flap over here, and you're going to put some color flow up here and make sure you've got uh, the real thing. Um, you're also looking for your Swan Gans catheter, this and that. And you can kind of see uh, what you've got here, and you can kind of see this 3D image of your ascending aorta with its dissection. This is actually the descending portion, so it must have a, a very nasty type A dissection. And this is the long axis view, and all you've done is you've gone 90 degrees from that same short axis view. So now you're looking at the ascending aorta. Uh, when I teach my first year students how to do T, they really break it down into student terms. They call the bicaval view the Mr. Mustachio view, and they call this making the hot dog. So uh, this is a very nice view for looking at a couple of things. You're looking for, uh, you, you can measure the diameters of the aorta. Uh, you can also get a nice view for dissection as well. Um, you can see clot here if you've got a, a, a P as well. You can typically see the tip of your swan. It's pretty cool to see it bouncing around in there. And this is your same view here, your 90 degree view from your short axis into your long axis, and you've got a nice little uh, dissection flap here. Again, you can put some color on there, uh, typically lower your scale to like 30 on your Nyquist limit and, and get a nice view of that. So a couple of things, uh, a couple of reminders about color flow Doppler. Um, typically, direction and velocity of blood is depicted as uh, blue away and red towards. Um, the imaging is inside to outside, such that the similar windows are going to be backwards. So where you're used to looking at MR as being blue because it's away from the transducer, uh, it's going to be red because it's towards the transducer. Because remember, your transducer is up here in the esophagus now, which is next to the left atrium. So Calculating an ejection fraction, you typically like to use uh, e eyeball EF, good or bad. But if you really feel compelled, you can take your area tool and you can, in your in your transgastric short axis, you can actually outline your um, the walls of the LV during diastole, outline the walls of your LV and systole, and using the same formula you used in the ICU when you're first starting to do ICU nursing, if you work there, uh, is you uh, subtract your end systolic area from your end diastolic area, divide by your end diastolic area, and that's your EF. And the EF in this patient is 57%, but you don't really need to say it's 57%. You can just see the amount of volume in systole versus diastole and say, well, your EF is about 50, which is all you really need to know. Same thing here. This is during diastole and this is during systole. Not much change, right? So you know it's bad. Or you can do the calculations and you could outline, you could take your, your, your tracing tool and it's 15 and a half centimeters squared, 12.9 centimeters squared, 15 and a half minus 12.9 is about, I don't know, 2.6 divided by 15, your EF is about 15%. So you can say good or for the, for the previous echo and bad for this one, or you can actually put some numbers on it. So this is an example of, of eyeball EF. You can see in this mid-esophageal four chamber over here, this is a real echo actually, LV is bad, right? Then you do the transgastric short axis, LV is still bad. And you can do all the fancy measurements that we just talked about to, to calculate this, but it's really not going to change much of what you're going to do uh, with your interventions. So just as an aside, can you document and bill for TE? Well, if you're a CRNA, and I presume you are since you're taking this particular uh, presentation, uh, you're not going to be able to bill for anything except for used as monitoring, which is about $114. If you are working with a cardiologist who is going to take your study that you have, have recorded and they are going to interpret it, they'll put the name of the interpreting physician, their findings and impression, then you can bill for $334. And um, these are the two different uh, ICD codes here. If you're just sticking the probe in for the cardiologist, it's $43, et cetera, et cetera. So while this may not interest you, this is just here for the sake of completion. So all this is fine and dandy, but how do you translate it from the from an online course into the operating room? How do you make it such that it is something that is very useful? Well, there's a couple of ways of doing it. Uh, you can either go into the OR, 
and just fumble your way through it like you did when you first started anesthesia, or you can use a simulator. And what I've found is that using a simulator, uh, I can pretty much get the same scores on a post-test um, as I would if I was in the OR. And there's several uh, different studies, one's by a guy named Smell that showed that his uh, cardiac surgeons that he took into his lab and worked with a simulator on scored slightly higher, although not significantly higher on a test as the cardiac surgeons that went to the OR to learn TE. But how does it rank against online? Simulation online versus online uh, simulator scores uh, and online scores on a standardized pretest from the Toronto Perioperative Interactive Enterprises uh, website, uh, my student scored a 35% across the board. Uh, then I divided into two groups. One got simulator and one just got an online version similar to what you're doing with this presentation. And the scores with the simulator were uh, twice as high as the pretest as compared as a nominal increase, which was good, but still not as good as, as a hands-on experience. So in summary, the FATE exam can be used as an assessment and a rescue tool. So if you can do the, get the four different positions and the six different windows with a transthoracic echo with a phased array, you can do a lot as far as assessment goes. And it's a big part of what the American Heart Association is recommending for preoperative assessment now. As well, you can use it as a rescue tool. You can, especially in the PACU, where you don't have the encumbrances of, of surgical prep and things like that. And then the FATE and the basic TE offer similar windows and assessment capabilities. However, I think you'll find if you start doing some TE that it's much easier to get the views. Plus the probe stays in the same spot. You don't have to rotate. Uh, and, and it's just a much better uh, uh, monitoring device. TE can be used interop as a monitor and to detect sources of cardiopulmonary instability. And as far as basic echo goes, you're not here to guide interventions. You're not here to tell the surgeon they didn't replace the mitral valve as well. Uh, you're not here to do anything except make a rough assessment, uh, point of care ultrasound, and then bump it up to a cardiologist. And then finally, Rescue Echo has very broad utility in the care of perioperative patients undergoing anesthesia. Here are some nice online resources. You've got a nice FATE video here. You've got a nice basic TE video. The Toronto site is outstanding. You can get online and do virtual TE, virtual TTE as well, even virtual uh, FAST exam. As well, you can do some 3D if you're doing some 3D um, as a CRNA. I know CRNAs in some, some practices that are actually guiding the interventions with the mitral clip, or at least they're showing the windows to the cardiologist. They're not necessarily telling them put the, where to put the mitral clip, but they're using 3D. So this is something that is uh, becoming not necessarily scope of practice yet, but it's coming. And if you work in, in any OR where there's a TE and you're left alone with a surgeon, you know that you're pretty much driving the probe yourself. These are some references. This is Scott Rees and the American Society of Echoes basic TE uh, treatise, which is where they basically say that you have to be a physician to do it, but they're not in the room with you the entire time. Uh, this is also a nice uh, role of echo in the interoperative period work, and this is Sasha Shilcutt's uh, Rescue Echo paper. Thank you very much.